It is the quickest and fastest nitrous oxide street tire motorcycle in the world, and it is bad. Settle in and stay with us. We're taking a look at Richard Gadsden and Brad Mummert and their incredibly popular old school 1980 Suzuki GS Pro Street drag bike. In this video, we're going to get to know Richard and Brad and we're going to give you everything you need to know about this amazing motorcycle. This team has worked incredibly hard to get this motorcycle to go 640s at over 220 miles an hour. As you can see, this tremendous amount of horsepower is not always easy to control. It's certainly not easy to ride, and Richard will talk all about that in our bench racing session coming up. A 649 at 215 was a crowd pleaser at South Georgia Motorsports Park. Street Motorcycle Class is primarily made up of turbocharged late model motorcycles, specifically the Suzuki Hayabusa. Fans go nuts for this old school Suzuki GS nitrous bike. It is something special and wait till you get a load of the amount of technology in use on this motorcycle. We're going to talk about it in depth coming up. Stay with us. Nine two thirteen. What do you think about that one? Uh, good. Not not bad start to the weekend. How Only about it, Ricky? Definitely not a bad start. Six forty nine today. More to come. York, Pennsylvania. It is home to the Harley Davidson factory. But in terms of the motorcycle world, it is also home to a very special bike. How about the world's quickest nitrous street bike? Come with us up the road because we're gonna meet Brad Mummert, Richard Gadsden, and see this amazing Suzuki GS that everybody goes wild about. All right, Cycle Drag, are you pumped? We told you we will travel the globe to bring you the absolute best. I got a feeling in here we're gonna see something you like in one of the most incredible motorcycles. There he is, how you Come doing? On in, Come on in, follow us. Mr. Brad Mummer, thank you so much for having us. You're I appreciate welcome. it. Thanks for oh, coming. Oh, I see something off in the horizon already. Well, before we get to that, look who we have over here. Mr. Mike Scholes, HDFR. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. The man, ladies and gentlemen, one of the best riders in the world, Richard Gadsden. I'm so pumped up. Do I, do I have a time limit? You guys are going to kick me out of here? Because I cannot if, wait. If we gave you one, would you abide by it? <laughs> Probably not, right? I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. We're getting ready to take a look at what is not only the world's quickest GS street bike, it is the world's quickest nitrous street bike. Right. You guys have come a long way, and the attention this thing attracts is amazing. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely probably, I would say, rivals... Spider-Man and maybe a few others for one of the most popular or attention-grabbing motorcycles in drag racing. Well, you're about to find out why. Stay with us. Let's head over and get a close look at the bike.
Just about everybody knows York, PA is the home of Harley Davidson, but how many of you know it is the home of this awe-inspiring, world's quickest nitrous street bike? Brad and Richard, first off, you guys gotta just give me a tour because this thing has so much technology, so many custom parts. Let's let's hear about it. Well, you got a 1980 Suzuki GS, um, what are you, 1100s back then? Or 1100, 1100. Yeah. Um, it's a 1,655 cc engine built by Rick Smith um, uh, with some help from Johnny Locklear, Airtime Motorsports, um, on some topping stuff, camshaft stuff. Um, we get help from Webb Camshaft, um, Vance and Hines, uh, Mitch Brown from Monster Race Products, um, Bill Robinson, R&D Transmissions, uh, MTC Clutch, um, J.E. Pistons, Pistons the, the biggest one. Um, especially for this year. Uh, that's been one of our biggest uh, turnaround points is uh, when we partner with JE Pistons. The chassis is uh, fabricated and done by Mike Schultz at HDFR. Um, and Eric Saglio at the time was working with them. They, whatever you're looking at right now, obviously this is a far stretch from what it started as. <laughs> yeah. um, and they did all the fabrication, the, even all the way down to the exhaust. Let's um, take a look at this exhaust. Everything is so trick on this motorcycle. Yeah, the exhaust, the front end, the swing arm, the, the shock mounts. We use a high booster shock, so uh, we had to do all that. To, you know, to fit for the booster stuff, a booster front end. Um, um, we run BST wheels. Brock's performance helped us out big time on those. Um, everybody's. I mean, this this bike has got to be a testament to the carbon fiber BST wheels. Is we've had them for years. I believe we put just as much stress or strain on them as anybody and uh, haven't had the slightest issue. None. Yeah. Um, Yeah, look at these monsters. I've yeah. never seen electrons like this. What are we looking at here? Well, they are 54 millimeter uh, billet. <sighs> these are not the, now when you get injectrons from electron, the majority of people have the, uh, they're just carburetors with no bowls on them and they put the injector in it in the fuel rail. And it's, uh, it's pretty much like a conversion from an actual carburetor, but this is a tapered throttle body. Um, that uh, Electron did and it's a billet throttle body. It's also an option that anybody can buy. It wasn't something that he did one off for us. Um, anybody can buy it. Um, uh, injector dynamics, injectors. Um, we have, uh, where was I at? Um, our ignition system is, uh, we run a Max ECU, Max wow. ECU, Race ECU. Steve Nichols helped us out a lot with the setup and the initial, initial tune of that. Um, and we run the energy coil um igniter and coils um they say you need air fuel and fire right so you got a uh, you got air through this big old hole here you got fuel through those big old injectors and then you got fire from energy coil so that's pretty much the, the our, our heartbeat there you got um um to take it a step further val val dick from energy coil partnered with um jason levitt from full spectrum and uh, and they got this bad name and jammer right here. Wow. Now, I am not an electronics genius, so I don't know why this is a good battery. I just know it's a bad MF. And uh, okay. it's been another thing. You know, I was never a person that thought that something like this meant so much in the tuning side of things. But we found crazy consistency um, and differences in the tune-up just from uh, power supply. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and trust me, it's measurable in your ET and measurable on your time slip. I don't know how to tell you the science of why or how. They could do that better than me, but I know it matters. Um, Behringer brakes, 
We used uh, Behringer brakes, front and rear uh, levers, calipers, and rotors. Well, no, no levers yeah. and calipers. I'm yeah. sorry, we do not use the rotors. Um, oh, let me see what else I'm missing. Um, carbon fiber body is done by uh, Terry Sunter from Montgomery Motorsports. Um, Joe from Unify has been real nice. Uh, good dude. He's made our church bearing support for the side. Uh, did some other nice little widgets here and there. He's real helpful whenever we give him a call and say, hey, I want something uh, something made. He jumps right on a force and knocks him out, but he does outstanding uh, CNC work. So I think the mic doesn't have time for it, can't get done. Joe hops on it and gets it done for us. Absolutely. Such an awesome bike. I want to talk about the evolution of this machine because I remember it started as a labor of love about 10 years ago. And I know that you're a big GS guy, as we can see back there. There's yep. This will bring back some memories. There is a bone stock 1980 GS. So this has always been a wildly popular project. But the the progress you guys have made, I remember when everybody was trying to get in the sixes, right? Yeah. yeah. And then That's... last year we were just talking, you guys were in the mid 660s. Right. Well, now 2019, you guys bring it all the way down to a 640. That makes you the quickest nitrous street bike in the world. Almost the, the quickest nitrous GS drag bike behind only Eric McKinney from what we can recall. I, where is this tremendous progress coming from? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you it's, both it's, have it's, something to say here. Obviously, that's not a short explanation. It's, uh, it's really from nitpicking. Um, it, it, even though the, the, there's a two and a half difference in a, in a season, but um, it comes from starting with track prep. We have a, a track surface nowadays um, where we can get away with things that we couldn't do at one point before. Um, another thing that we picked up from um, is the ignition system, like I just mentioned, uh, from huge help from Valor at Energy Co. I, it's, it's a little bit beyond just the surface of we bought an igniter and coils from you and it made us go faster. It's a lot deeper than that. Um, the uh, And like I said, nitpicking on the tune-up. When I say nitpicking, I mean I'm to the point now where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tune different sections of the racetrack. I mean, it's, it's retarded, man. Like uh, trying to find the limits in different areas. Okay, well, I didn't know what I can get away with here, or what I can get away with there, and and trying it and seeing if it works. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. I can make a million passes in a row um, consistently, and it be not slow, but you know, like slower, I should say. And then you can get to the point where you start getting greedy and testing the limits. And then once you find those limits, you try to figure out how to stay there consistently. So that's just been what it is, man. Um, just. And I got, I got to jump in real quick because I got to throw a little bit of BS up on that answer. I love that answer, but every drag racer in the world says that. And guess what? They pick up a couple hundreds here and there. How do you pick up two and a half tenths over an off season? It's staggering. True, true story, Jack. Uh -oh. It's the same exact motor, the same size, the same head, the same cams, same cams, the same chassis, the same everything. Yeah. And it 665 is. at the one time was 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 fast for it. That was the fastest we had ever been. But it, it, honest to God, it, it wasn't a BS answer. It was the truth. It really comes from nitpicking up all of those things. A lot of it's been in the ignition system. A lot of it. I, for me, I think the biggest thing that's happened since putting fuel injection on has been huge. Yeah. Richard was after me for a year or so before we did it to actually switch to fuel injection. And when did you make the switch to fuel injection? Um, 18. Guys. 18, yeah. okay. The last, we had it on the last two races of 18. And so, you knew right away that this is the way to go? Uh, the first race I was maybe scratching my head a little bit. We struggled with some things, new bug stuff, but really, uh, it went down, we went to 690, 680, something yeah. like that. But then the next race out, I went to 665, 
And at that point, I was convinced. But I think for me, watching Richard and, and, and he actually tunes it. I mean, he rides it, tunes it. He's the brains behind it. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that. Well, he's part. He's the keyboard yeah. clapper. How, how about that? We got a collective <laughs> effort here yeah, of brains, so, right? We got a lot of smart guys. So. so, But the ability for us to go out there and repeat numbers, I think, has been huge. Before, when we had carburetors and the other stuff on, it wouldn't repeat. we go back and make a change in the pits and think it's going to help us, and it slowed us up or it made no difference. And just There was no, no rhyme or reason. So this way we can go out and Richard wants to work on the first 3.30. We can go into the ECU, we can make changes that affect the first 3.30. Doesn't affect the back half of the track. The ability to tune the whole racetrack, individual increments, right? Yeah. And be consistent has been huge. And that was, the consistency thing was one of the things Val kept preaching to us, uh, was you need to get consistent, you need a, a strong ignition system that's consistent, so your tune up repeats. And those are the kinds of things that have helped tremendously this year. Yeah, true. And, and, and it's not to say that fuel injection is better than carburetors. That's such a, a, a widely asked question, and, and, the, and the response is like, it's so confusing. So obviously, we could have went fast with carburetors. It was the wet nitrous part that I, I never really got a handle on that to the, to the extent where I could really uh, use all of it. I don't know if I was running out of fuel in the bowls, or I don't know we had... 35 different theories. Um, we never really got to the period at the end of the sentence, but uh, so I should say when we converted to fuel injection, the things that I was trying to do made more sense. Everything was, you know, it was easier for me to duplicate. Um, it's just it's just a little easier for me. Now, somebody else might tell you polar opposite, but it was easier for me. And that was really one of the biggest things was just finding how to, when I make a change, it actually did what I asked it to do kind of a thing, you know? and. Um, and I don't want to do any digs or, or, or make any other products look bad, but, but I do believe that it was something else tuning related that wasn't as consistent and it had a lot of glitches and a few issues or whatever the case may be, and I needed to get rid of Look at you. That side. Love the politically correct answer. You're a smart man. <laughs>
the pass, you know, you got a lot of preparation before you get up to the actual part of making a, a, a pass. Um, Brad makes sure, make sure the bottle is right. I don't even have to think about that. Um, he makes sure the tire is right. Um, Mike makes sure everything is plugged back in from all of our between pass maintenance, whatever. So only thing I got to do is when I get up there, before I roll in the burnout box, I flip on my ignition to heat up the O2 sensor. Where's the ignition at? Ignition switch is right here. I know they're not labeled. I've just been riding it so long. I just know which one is which. Flip on the ignition switch there, get the O2 heated up. Um, I do that usually when I'm pushing into the burnout box. Um, when, you, when you say get the O2 heated up, what are you talking about? The O2 sensor is in the collector over here. Gotcha. It's, uh, it's what measures our air fuel ratio. It's what, you know, most, you know, obviously we all use for tuning. Sure. Um, and at you, the O2, when you first turn it on, it doesn't work. Um, it has to get heated up first and you get really good data. So that's what I do is um, I heat up the O2 sensor. When I'm in the burnout box, when it's time to fire up, I then reach down here and I flip this switch on here. Usually there's a battery in here. That battery is for the vacuum pump, which is if you look down in there between that pipe, the vacuum pump is in there. We run a star vacuum pump. Um, so I'll flip on the vacuum pump. Once it gets spinning, I... And what's the vacuum pump do for somebody who doesn't know? Oh, um, man, you're testing me. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that it, it releases crankcase pressure. Gotcha. Um, not cylinder pressure, but crankcase pressure. Um, and uh, I guess it just helps with the piston having to fight back down against crankcase pressure. I, I'm not really... That's a little bit above my expertise. Got you. That's about as far as I made with it. No, I pre that was um, good, and I'm sure some folks in the comments can help us. That's yeah. something that Pro Stock Motorcycles have used yeah, now for all, years. Yep, they all yeah. use it. That was one of, the, one of the reasons why we started using it. Um, so, all right, so continuing so I, on here. I'll flip on that vacuum pump. Once that starts spinning, I reach up here, and this is the starter switch. You pull it down, pull it. It's a momentary switch. Start the bike up, and that's that. Um, I always push it with the bike in neutral. First gear is up on this motorcycle. So I'll push it down one time in a second. I do my burnouts in second gear. I know everybody says on a full automatic transmission, you can't do second gear burnouts. I call BS, I've been, it's all I've ever done. Some second gear um, um, not really huge burnouts all the time but it depends on the conditions or whatever uh, once I come out the burnout I put it put it up in first gear flip the nitrous switch on here by that time Brad's always turning the bottle on my nitrous pressure shows up in the right corner of this dash now that's incredibly important right making sure we get that bottle pressure right exactly. is that difficult no not really Mm -mm. You have a reading right there on the dash that tells you where it's at? It'll pop up right here in this corner of this dash. Um, What's the number you're looking for? 900 PSI. 900 PSI. Does it vary a lot based on weather and things like I that? I never change it. Wow. Never change it. Amazing. Then with the purge, are you? is there a certain technique with the purge? Purge button's right here. Um, Brad sets the bottle a little bit high. Uh, if you come over here, you'll see the blue button here. Um, it's nice billet uh, grip assembly that we got from Growthers Drag Bikes. Purge button is just sitting right here by my thumb, and I just hit that button right there. How much fun is it to purge this thing? That's got to be one of the more <laughs> enjoyable activities. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. If we if we took some time and made it interesting, where it shot up. I remember back in the day, in like the Pro Star days, people came up with all these interesting ways to purge their nitrous. We're pretty boring. It just comes out over here, but it gets the job done. So yeah, we got some great video of you purging too. It looks. Cool. pressure right um i'm in first gear already uh once i push forward in the stage this bottom button over here is a two-step button two-step wide open throttle when the light comes on let that one go and i do not auto shift this motorcycle i shift it myself wow um the shift light uh if you come over here i'll show you as i stated this is the two-step button here this is my shifter button here so once i'm two-step wide open let that button go this is my shift light. All of that lights up. And uh, this is my shift button right here.
that's it. And then the rest is off to the races and get your shift points and get to the finish. And finish what's the 60 foot time typically on this motorcycle? We've been 105. Oh my gosh. Which was ridiculous. That is um, ridiculous. But it's usually 07 to 110. We can pretty much consistently go 108, 109. Every time, uh, every time I go on the track. So, for somebody watching this who has only ridden street bikes or maybe a Hayabusa ZX14, how does that compare? Man, th we got this bike under control so, so good that it doesn't feel like that. I don't even think it looks like that or sounds like that. Um, um, but I've ridden some other bikes that really smack you pretty hard, and uh, and you get the time slip in this 112, 110, 109. But this one just seems like it just kind of walks off the line real smooth i think it's i know no i know exactly why that is i don't know if i should say it on the camera you could, this is a this is an <laughs> unedited raw interview you let you let whatever you want to say as long as we're not going to get you in trouble career-wise right. well it's a few reasons why it, it, it is that way but um that was on purpose um so that we could be more consistent that was part of the consistency plan got you and you guys have been very consistent with this bike yeah for the most part man we uh up until the last four or five runs in Valdosta at the World Finals, we had gotten the bike to where it would just go mid-40, like, I mean, just almost at will all the time, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. But, um, you know, it, 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 we I think we can be pretty consistent on it most times. Well, here's what we got to address, because I'm sure a lot of people are looking at your, your famous tank <laughs> insignia, and clearly... You guys don't like the turbos too much, but in your in your category, it is dominated by turbos. Turbo Hayabusa's, turbo GSXR's. This bike was was let in, I do believe, a long time ago with a special set of rules because people loved it so much, and they said, "Hey, if you want to go after this, go ahead." Are you are you happy with the rules package? With the rules package, I mean they they gave us what we needed to go fast when uh, when. When IDBL or IDBA or whatever it was gave us the rules with a billet cylinder head, that was at the point where I was ready to throw the towel in because we couldn't keep a stock casting head on it. So we ended up getting that. That improved the program. As far as wheelbase and everything else, yeah, they gave us what we needed to go fast. Now for 2020, uh, one of the things we've always joked about, we always wanted to go fast enough that they change the rules based on our motorcycle. Well, it appears we've got our wish that there's going to be some rule changes coming for next season to, to, to bring class parity back. And I'm, you know, Richard and I, one of the reasons he's here today, we were talking about that and doing some uh, preliminary mock-ups on what we may have to, to change to make it legal for next year. Uh, makes sense. I get it. You know, it's, it's tough when you got a couple guys going really fast and, and a bunch of people behind us uh, that were given some... We were given a lot to go fast, so it's it's. I'm okay with it. Slow us up. Got you. Now, when you talk about the cylinder head, is that the four valve monster? Yep. All right. So this is a huge talking point in pro stock motorcycle right now. We're seeing the Suzukis are allowed to use the four valve monsters. You think that's going to make a big difference for them, based on your experience? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, and then that I don't know isn't a. I don't think so. I don't know. It is literally I don't know because I don't know what the pro stock guys need or looking for um i don't know but uh, i know that four valves back when harley had it was supposed to be an advantage because it you know whatever it was about the four valve deal and when it went back to two it was supposed to slow them down so i think that people's minds think it's the same thing here but i don't know um yeah i, I hope it does I, you know i'm a suzuki fan i'm a i'm a i'm an inline four guy so i hope that it does pick them up some um but we'll see. I know that there's some other four valve cylinder head coming out that's really yes. really bad too. So And I may or may not have been in a secret location in Brownsburg, Indiana and heard a little something about that. So <laughs> you know Vance and Hines, man, if they're at work on something, they're gonna come out with a product that is absolutely killer. Exactly. So and that's and that's a good thing. That's 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 good. You got two different manufacturers, two different deals. I'm I'm assuming the privateer guys will use the monster deal and try to make that work. I'm assuming Vance and Hines customer base and Vance and Hines and make theirs work um i would assume just for the simple fact that they're doing some more or something new that they would probably pick up or find some sort of horsepower somewhere yeah. brad another question i have here getting back to the turbo versus nitrous rivalry i talked to cecil towner from htp who ran the first ever pro street six with ryan schnitz he was a big nitrous guy and he said eventually what he got sick of is his team was sweating in the summer heat changing shift forks changing motors all kind of stuff and he says he looks over at the turbo guys and they're drinking gatorade 
getting ready for the next round. <laughs> do you guys ever feel like that? I think we do less work than they do. I think so too. How have you been able to achieve that? Because attrition has always been a factor with these nitrous bikes. This year, uh, JE Pistons was a big piece of this. We didn't have a lot of issues normally at the track. We've actually nicked a couple of transmissions here and there. But uh, through all the years of building this, we figured out what breaks, what didn't break. We bought parts to, to fix all that. And our last weak link was uh, Pistons. So Jay came on board with us this year. And realistically, um, maintenance-wise on the powertrain, it's been my best year ever. Uh, we ended up replacing the train. We, we nicked the shift fork air. But other than that, top end wise, it's been solid. Pistons have been in the bike since the beginning of the season. Hi, Jack. What do you think's going to be low this session, Brad? One of these two. <laughs> What's your guess? 39. Wow. Let's get crazy. Let's go with a 39. I got it plugged in. Cylinder head's been solid all season. We had that freshened up over the winter. From the base gasket or head gasket down, it's basically a Vanson Hines setup. It's Eddie does the blocks for us. He freshened that up over the winter. There are crankshafts. Uh, he did the case prep for us. So. It's a very, at this point, it's a very solid, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty reliable unit when you're trying to go six forwards. And, and to be totally fair, um, JE was a huge part of it. Um, the piston that we have in this wasn't an off the shelf piston or design that they already had. It was something that we were already, well, Johnny, um, our engine guy was already working on and, and they perfected it. They came together and, and made it good. But, uh, the tune-up side of it has also been a big yeah. thing. We've gotten a handle, and you would think just naturally through having that many passes on something and keep trying and trying and trying, you know, you, you, you don't just burn something up and then just go out there and do it again. If you burn it up, you try to figure out why did I burn it up or what did I do wrong? And there was plenty of days where we were like, nah, I don't know, I don't know what I did. It just yeah. didn't like something. And yeah. then, you know, you just try to learn from it. And again, I know I keep plugging them, but Johnny, it's kind of my mentor and my coach. I do Johnny Locklear. Got you. Um, and I mean, absolutely. Yeah. So Legend. I do a lot of, I do the pass to pass tuning calls per se, but if I'm ever confused or lost on something or whatever the case may be, he answers the phone every single time I call. Um, yeah. It's amazing. We got to so, get him back out there. Oh, we were going to get him back not, out? But <laughs> <laughs> well, he's moved on to other things. He's having yeah. fun, like staying home. Yeah, he's just, he... The travel, as you know, you go to a lot of, you yeah. put a lot of miles on a year, don't you? he's in that thing where he's done it so long, he's at that point in his life where he's he's all right with what he did, when he did it, and yeah. and that's that. But uh, between him and J.E. Um, and the tuna stuff, I just think that we just kind of got a real big um, on, a handle on uh, what, we were, what we've been trying to work on for the last year and a half. So here's a big question. Moving forward, is there more left in this machine? Is it possible to get this thing in the 630s? Is that a goal? Where are you guys at with this? It, it, it was a goal uh, in Valdosta. That was one of the reasons why we went to Valdosta to hope to go a 30 before the end of the year. We really wanted to be Eric McKinney's 36. Now, that sounds crazy. And we knew that it was a, that's a tall was, order and a far fetch. And, and for it, people that don't know, that's on a pro mod bike with a, a wheelie bar and what, a 10 and a half right. inch slick? Yep. Crazy. That was, that was what he rode, um, and that's what, you know, they have bigger motors than us and everything, but they are a few pounds. I think they're 20, 20 or 20, <clears throat> 20 or 25 pounds heavier than us. Okay. But um, uh, we wanted to try it then, but this year with the new rules, as of right now, unofficially, Jason Miller put out the pr preliminary rules. Um, which are up for discussion, but he took an inch of wheelbase from us. We were 75 inches at 600 pounds. Um, right now, we're supposed to be 74 at, uh, at, si at 635. So that's an inch of wheelbase and 35 pounds. That should put us pretty good into the 660s and maybe upper, maybe even upper 660s. So I put a post up and I asked Jason if he would reconsider maybe take another inch of wheelbase out of us and 
and no weight or or just any kind of middle ground between where we were and uh and him and a few other other pro street competitors we all talked about it and i'm hoping that it, that our punishment isn't that harsh i agree we all agree it needs to, we need to do something yeah. we need to slow down i get it i just think that'll be a little bit too far to the extreme so i'm hoping for some kind of medium ground that's got to be tough as a rider and a team owner that in any class where everything's not exactly the same, it's going on in pro stock, motorcycle, it goes on yep. everywhere. To maintain parity, tough decisions have to be made. How tough is it when you make an advancement and then you guys, you say, oh man, we might have went too fast. Now we're going to get penalized. I, it's tough. I mean, like the whole, my whole focus on going drivers is always to go quicker. So, you know, our goal was to go 630s. Well, we're not, that goal is not going to be there anymore. So now it's going to be we have to back up. And whatever whatever the bike runs, it's going to be we want to be at the front of the pack. So if the new, the new fast bikes are running 650 flats or 648s, we want to be one of those guys. So, well, uh, like Richard and I were talking before you got here, it's just it's a new challenge. We were, we were always looking for another reason to get after the bike and try new things and try and go quicker. Well, this will be the new challenge on how we manage this. Overall, as a class, Pro Street, we watched everybody step up big. Almost everybody. I know you said you were paying attention to details and whatnot. Everybody must have been doing the same because I remember a year ago, Frankie Stotts shocked the world when he went 660. And then by the end of 2019, we saw a 638. Litton went like, what, 232 on his Hayabusa. How is everybody just getting quicker and faster? You know, that's funny how that works. I remember back when Jeremy Teasy rode John Drake's No Fear bike. Nobody had ever been in the 680s, right? Jeremy went 684 in Indy. And then after that, it wasn't long after, everybody was going 80s. Right. And then somebody went 70s, and then everybody, I mean, it's like a thing where everybody kind of rises to the occasion. I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's like an unspoken thing. It's like, you know what? I think it's like the, the winners just find a way. I got to go faster. So you start trying to do things that you hadn't done before. But I don't know what happened last year to this year because it's not just a small performance. You know, the rumor at the beginning of the year was, oh, XDA is playing with the rollout. They made the rollout long, so everybody's flying. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's not the rumor anymore because we all went down to Valdosta and went fast too at the Man Cup race. We went 40s down there as well and had some 160 foots and everything like that too. So, And we do it in Virginia as well. So it's, we're doing it way too many places for that rumor. It, we, I'm pretty sure we can put that one to bed. But I just think, That's I think, right. I think it's a competitive nature of everybody. Rodney and Aaron, we've been chasing them for years. Yeah. I mean, everybody, the whole class, for the most part, you had DME and Joey Gladstone, they had a run and, and Jeremy. Here and there, but as far as consistency over the last few, I think last year, Rodney and Aaron between the grudge racing and Pro Street, every single time they rolled into an event, they won a class. So they were kind of like this year when Frankie went to Valdosta, he went to 60 flat four or five times in a row. I think it was an unspoken thing that you know what? Next year has got to like everybody's got to get serious. You got to get consistent. You got to get fast. So when the season started, it was who would be the first in the 50s? I think Rodney went all the way to NHDRO in Gainesville to try to do it. Jeremy and those guys went to the Man Cup race in Valdosta, and I was sitting on the couch sick to my stomach. I just knew it was <laughs> going to happen. And I think both of them came really, really, really close, but neither one of them did it until we all went to Maryland, the first XDA race. Uh, Frankie, Frankie was yeah. the first to do it. Um, and then before that, he went the first in the 50s, I believe it was a 58. Before the end of that weekend, Jeremy had went in the 40s. I went in the 50s. Uh, Frankie was in the 50s, yeah. and I think it was like four people. I think Aaron or Rodney or somebody else went 50s. Somebody else went 50s all in the same weekend. So, uh, Frankie went from first in the 50s to the fourth fastest in the same weekend. It was just, and it's been crazy. Honest to God, it's been the most exciting thing I've ever been a part of. It's been the most exciting racing. I think internet, everybody watches Pro Street to see what's going to happen next, and and who's going to go what, where that case may be. I think it was a good, fun year before now Jason's like, all right, now, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fans love it, that's for sure. It's so fun to watch. Uh, I know I'm getting old because I remember when a nine-second street bike was fast. And one thing I want to touch on here real quick, the name of the class is Pro Street. Obviously, we're going to get a ton of comments on yeah. YouTube where people say, hey, that's not a street bike. Yes, we've opened Pandora's box. We've it's taken not. a lot of components off. But let me ask you this. I talked to Jordan Haas this year, yeah. 
Yeah. And he talked about how Frankie sometimes rides his. He said the only problem is we've taken the cooling systems off. This being an air-cooled GS, if Richard wanted to ride this down to Quaker Steak and Lube to go get some wings, could we do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Look. Come on, you're dashing my hopes. Bike yeah, week. How about I, Main Street on bike I'm week? I'm going to say what we couldn't do, but I know what we wouldn't be doing again. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I don't think it'll still be. I mean, you got a couple problems. The transmission, an automatic transmission, it's got to uh, get to high gear before you can decelerate. So every time I take off from the traffic light, I have to go to high gear. That would be annoying. that would be tough. It doesn't have a clutch lever. It has a slider clutch with the stall RPM and everything. So that would be a pain in the butt. And then it just ain't, man, the ground thing. It just... It's just not a street bike. That's been long, long past. If you look up on Brad's wall here, I think that's the last time they've been somewhat close to street bike. What yeah. year was that? That would have been, that would have been the last year I rode, so that would have been 2000. Wow. And this is him with uh, Keith Dennis. Oh, yeah. Legend. Legend. Um, and back then they had the road courses. So yeah. when you get to the race, you had to ride 10 miles. I remember that. Yeah, 10 miles, shut it off, and you had 30 seconds to start it back up. If we brought that back, oh no, I won't talk about if it. If we brought that back, we're not going to bring it back here. But where would the performance be? Because we see the class real street, you know, in the in the seven second zone. Where would you be if you required a ten mile road course? And Scooter Kaiser, he used to have it. If your bike didn't refire, you were done. You'd have to go on the road course, refire, or you were out. You didn't qualify. Well, I don't know. I don't know where it would be performance wise. Um, I think so many things would have to change yeah. on them. It would. Be, it would. I, I have no idea. I mean, you would essentially have to look at something like this with better chassis. So I would say maybe low sevens or something. I don't know if it, how, how they would be affected by it. I know we don't have a cooling system, so mine wouldn't make it to 10 miles. So <laughs> Well, back then when we did it, all the, the bulk of the bikes were Nypress bikes. So that whole ride it, stop, let it heat sink, and then restart it was always fun. But it would definitely be a challenge. And the guys with the turbos now and alcohol, just like the streetcar stuff, the drag week stuff, doing it with a nitrous car or a bike is really, really tough. What was the performance like back then when we look at this picture? What that was your picture? Yeah, what was your uh, ET? That was probably like an 830 bike back then. God, and that was fast, man. Yeah. That was fast. Yeah. Brock Davidson broke the internet when he became the first one in the sevens. Yeah. And look at us now. Where are we going? Are we going to top fuel? Because you guys are getting close. No. Uh, we're, we're not catching Larry, but I always throw that example out there. Yeah. Mitch Brown won a race running 620s. Yeah. Yeah. You guys aren't that far away from 620s. Yeah. No. Two different worlds. Yeah. I mean, this, what we're doing is cool. The street bike stuff's cool. But it, in my opinion, these are nothing but uh, modern day pro mod cars. You know, and this bike in particular is, is a pro mod, pro mod motorcycle with a street tire. And old body work on it. Well, I got a question I got to ask, and we may even have to bring in our resident engineer over here, a very, very smart guy, <laughs> because it just doesn't make sense to me with a street tire and no wheelie bar. How are you almost matching the performance of a custom built chassis that has the luxury of a drag slick and a wheelie bar? How is that possible? It doesn't make sense. No, no. Uh... But it's all around power management. I mean, it's it's again, it's kind of looking to look at the the car world right now, where you got the the drag radio stuff is going crazy fast, and it's all around power management, how you get it down the track, and that's where between him and Johnny, uh, they definitely know how to get no bar bikes down the racetrack. <laughs> Hey Brad, what do you think about that one? Uh, 
Man, good. Not, not bad start to the weekend. How Always about it, Ricky? Team, Definitely sir. not a bad start. 6.49 today. More to come. And that's been huge. Well, that is something that Uncle Ricky gave us a clinic on. You've been you've been groomed for this since what? How old <laughs> How old did Ricky start you out? Man, uh, I, I started riding probably when I was maybe nine or ten or oh. something like that. But I started racing at uh, fifteen. Love it. Back in the post -art. And are you in Are you in high demand now? I see it all kind of grudge races. The guys just call you constantly. We want you to come in and ride our bike. Yeah, this is. Yeah, it gets to be a lot. Um, and I I, I guess I am. I'm, I'm flattered and appreciative of all those guys and opportunities. Um, I'm at the point now where I kind of got to like start joining them down a little bit so I can not be ready to go crazy at some of these events. But, uh, but yeah, um, yes, that's, I guess that is what it's turned into. Brad, question for you over here. You've stuck with this now for so long and you've proven that this is a viable and competitive combination. Why aren't we seeing more? Why hasn't somebody else done this? Because it's such a popular bike you take it to PRI, people go nuts. You take it to the pits, people go nuts. Why have none of our other GS lovers out there tried this thing? Because um, it's certainly not the cheap way to go. Um, there was so much, it's evolved to this. To get to this point, it's taken a lot of work, uh, a lot of trial and error. This is probably what fifth or sixth version of this motorcycle that we've rolled out. They may not look different, but there's been plenty of subtle changes over the years uh, from swing arms to just, we've, we've done a lot of tweaking to make it get where it's at. Motor wise, there's been several versions of that through the frame rails, different versions of what we're doing presently. Uh, so it looks easy now, but it took 10 years to get here, you know, and a lot of money spent and a lot of Mike's time uh, welding and cutting and, Richard tolerating for a season or two, us not being able to get down the racetrack or going down to get him and he pulls a carburetor around that's got a got a whole intake port full of epoxy hanging on the end of it, things oh. like that. And, you know, it's pretty crazy. And the piggyback on that, I just think that it's uh it's almost crazy to try to to duplicate. I mean you can, the rules are there for you to do whatever you want, but um it's so easy to go buy Hayabusa parts to yeah. Everybody makes aftermarket parts for them. Everybody makes front end swing arms, body work. That is so easy to do a higher booster. You almost have to wonder why wouldn't you just do a booster? And I ask Brad every year, <laughs> man, can we build a booster? Can we build a booster? Can we build a booster? But, um, you know, we so far along on this project. I'm pretty sure when he's done with this, that'll be it. But it's just way easier to build a booster, man. It yeah. sure is. People love the old school, though, don't they? Yeah. Every, everything on this is one off. There's not. I mean, powertrain wise, I can order parts and get crankshafts and things like that. But chassis wise, everything on it's been is one off. We had to make it and make it probably three, four times to get it where we wanted. So. Well, let me ask you this: What you're doing reminds me of what Larry Spiderman McBride is doing. You're taking a one off bike, you're developing it, and now Larry is in a position where a lot of people want to buy what he developed. I'm not trying to make you super busy here, but. If uh, all of a sudden three, four guys say, hey, we, we want one of these. Are you interested in pumping them out? Well, I think people have called Mike and uh, the, the common statement is what's well, just a GS, right, Mike? So when he, <laughs> when he ends up telling them how much work's involved and the price tag to modify the stock cradle to get to this point, yeah, well, maybe not. Maybe I mean, not. Just to take a stock GS cradle and cut all the tabs and all the webbing out and then replace it all. What do you got in? Just just a bare cradle, Mike. 20 hours, 30 hours worth of shit. Probably like 12 hours just cutting everything up and grinding it down. You know? I mean, to duplicate the frame as a roller would be 19, 20,000 bucks. Gotcha. Which shouldn't be unheard of for some of these deep pocket drag racing guys, right? I wish I'd meet him. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't never met him yet. And I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Mike, let me ask you, you've had such an important and vital role on this motorcycle. Watching it from start to where it is now, what's it been like? Well, I always looked at it as, you know, I, I've always expected it to go fast, to be honest with you. But I, reason, I believe the only reason it goes fast is the people that are involved in it. I. I could build a bunch of chassis and give them a the whole bunch of people, but I don't think it would be the same, you know? And I think 
it's the people that make it all click together. You take any one of us out of it, it may not do the same. It, maybe it'll do better, but I doubt it, you know. What would you say has been the biggest challenge with this project? Space. Yeah, space. <laughs> space in terms of what? everything fit on the bike. Because there's not a lot. You don't got a luxury of a big, big chassis, big yeah. willy bar bike, right? Yeah. Trying to get everything in this right place. It takes time and... Um, somewhat ingenuity, I guess, or guessing a lot, you know. That's why, like Brad said, almost everything on that bike has been made three to five times over. Amazing. What's been the biggest breakthrough, you feel like, that you finally had that idea that, hmm, I think this is going to work, and it ended up being something that did? I think the thing that works the best on the bike is the suspension, you know. Is that something enough. where you guys have worked with a suspension manufacturer or is that just something where you've mm, just something i've done over the years and changes we've made on there from the beginning you know um i mean actually on brad's purple bike up there in the picture i built that frame and it was a monoshock too but it wasn't nothing like this monoshock yeah. you know it come a long way yeah. well the final thing i gotta ask you here is we see your shirt we know you obviously love harley davidson what attracted you to this old school suzuki gs project I mean, I started with Suzuki's and Kawasaki's, you know, and, and uh, I work at a Harley dealer now, and it's just that the Harley dealer that I work for is a racing guy. He's he's given me the opportunity to build Brad's bike because a lot of the stuff that I've done, I couldn't have done without the Harley dealer, Mike Vantucci, the owner of it. And uh, he's he lets us use the trailer to go racing. Um, you know, he's a Harley guy, but he's a, a race guy, you know. He's raced all his life. He's well in his 70s now, I think. And, uh, you know, he's just, he's he's been very good to me, and he's been very good to, I think, the team. Very good. You know? well, we, we appreciate your hard work on this. Well, I don't work no harder than them guys do. So. <laughs> Marcus, how's it going, man? We're seeing some wild performances out there. Oh, definitely. The air has kind of, you know, changed up a lot. And, uh, you saw the, the Hummer, the Gadsden bike wheelie a lot. And so I think a lot of people are trying to get their hands around the tune. How's it going with them two shocks this weekend? Outstanding, man. I've got a lot of people in Pro Street. I'm really happy about that. Well, we wish you the best. I know with these changing conditions, you got your work cut out for you. Absolutely. Thanks, Jack. And of course, there is the suspension that Mike was telling us about. Marcus McBain, M2 Shocks, helping you guys out. How important has that been, working with a sophisticated suspension builder? Uh, Marcus has been really good. He's been with us for about three seasons now. Mm -hmm. uh, always is willing to come over to the trailer. He uh, videos every run when he's at the track. Comes back and critiques what he thinks between him and Richard and us. We, If there's going to be any shock changes, we decide on it. Uh, to be honest, this year we really, I don't think we, we, we didn't it. touch it. I, I think at one point, first race of the year, we put a little bit of spring in it, and that was the end of it. It pretty much stayed the same all year. So the consistency around that also has been, been huge. Uh, since this is unedited, if you want to touch on the wheelie sensor deal and, the, and all of that stuff. Yeah, let's, let's hear it. Let's hear it, Richard. Let's hear it. Traction, well, that's something I like. When you got on here and did your routine, I like the fact that you were working. You're like, I shift this thing myself. I do this. A big complaint about drag racing. There's a debate going on right now. I'm sure you guys know it's going on in the car world. People say, why don't we just have robots out there? That's where we're going with traction control and all this stuff. And then there's the other side that says, hey, it's all about all out performance and technology. Let's show the best of the best, no matter what it is. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's the natural evolution of the sport. And it, and it's just the technology is there to 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 exploit so people are going to do it. Um, um, I personally, it's, if you ask me why I don't use wheelie control or traction control, my answer is not going to be that interesting. It's just I don't know about it. I don't know how to. I don't know I don't know what it entails. Now, the wheelie control is a little deeper than that. I feel like if as a rider, my whole life I've been 
riding the bikes per se. That's the term, riding, right? I've been riding the bikes. And if it was to wheelie, I would compensate. I would roll the throttle. But if we had a wheelie sensor, we would ask it to compensate. We would ask the ECU to compensate, however it is that you tell it to do that. Um, so we'd have two different compensations going on. Now, I don't know what to do with that data. You know, like, what what do you do with that? I, I still feel like if it picks the wheel up, I'm never going to conscious, consciously say, no, I'm just going to trust the, the bike. I'm just going to trust that it's going to bring it back down. I'm still going to roll the throttle because it's a natural reaction that I do. And I ride way too many motorcycles to become reliant on things like that. I mean, I might ride this motorcycle and three minutes later, I'm back on the track on another bike. I don't want to try to remember, oh, this one's auto ship. Oh no, wait, do I auto ship this one? Oh, this one's got wheelie control, but the other one doesn't. I'm going to start flipping bikes, missing gears and everything. So to keep it simple, I shift them all. I, I, I ride, I throttle ride them all. I just do it myself. I, I trust myself. Now the traction control, um, is again, like I said, I just don't know how to use it. I don't know what to do. I've never even been in that part of the ECU. I probably go to three screens on this whole ECU. The simplicity of what we do with this bike is probably scary versus how fast it's going. But um, I just I just don't use it. And honestly, I don't need it much. This thing I, I doesn't probably, really spin. Yeah, I've only spun a handful. I probably can count on one hand how many times I've spun the whole second half of the season. Um, or maybe even the whole season at all. I, I only remember in my mind one pass. So, Amazing. Um, I'm sure there's yeah, more. You have had knock on wood, hallelujah. You've had a very safe run history. I know this year, though, you guys had a little teeny hookup. It was a freak fluke thing down the shutdown, right? I called you guys. Oh, my rip. Yeah. 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 We, we, I know. We're not talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was, it was like an incredibly low speed wreck, right? Well, I was probably going, I was going less than 100 for sure, maybe 80-ish. Well, it's not that low speed. I'm 16. sorry. I thought it was less than that. Well, that's <laughs> that's enough to get my attention. Here's the whole deal, because there was a lot of rumors about it. People thought they confused my wreck with another person's wreck who actually did wreck on the return road. I didn't crash on the return road. I crashed on the track. But when I stopped tumbling, when I ended up stopping, I was literally standing in the turnoff, like right there at the first turnoff at VMP. The ambulance guy got up off the ground and walked straight and sat on the back of his ambulance. That's just how it happened to be where I stopped. Um, but what, it, what ended up happening was a, a pair in front of me had an oil down, um, a bad oil down. Um, they cleaned up the track. I know they used some of the powder stuff, whatever. And I don't think the track was unsafe. I don't think there was oil on the racetrack. I think that me not being aware of the situation, a lot of times because I'm trying to get back to ride another bike, I try to make the first turn off and I've done it a bunch of times. I've been doing it for years in this particular situation. Um, it was kind of a last minute decision. Oh, let me make this first turn off. And that requires heavy braking. And I might've got a little bit too greedy on the front brake, given the fact that they had just cleaned up an oil down and, uh, and it didn't like it. It let me know it body slammed me and, uh, the bike actually kind of rode down on the guard wall got to the end of the track and then just sat so, it. it was just stopped so, sitting up against wow. the guard wall like I put it there. It never, oh. it never fell over. Never fell over. Thank God you're okay. And I'm glad you told that story because I think there's a valuable lesson there. You, not to flatter you too much here, but you definitely are one of the best in the world. You've done this thousands and thousands of times, but isn't that a reminder that on any given pass, Larry McBride tells me that all the time. He says the minute you forget that the motorcycle is the boss. Yeah. You can get in big trouble. These yeah. these motorcycles on any level yeah. will make you remember that they're the boss. You can't afford to get, I'm gonna call that disrespectful towards the bike. I mean, it, we're going over 200 and something mile an hour and I got the bright idea that I'm gonna make the first turn off. Like I said, I've done it a million times, but just getting complacent, just because I've done it a million times, I mean, I'm gonna do it a million and one. And, uh, and that was kind of what happened there. You know, we're going over 200 mile an hour and uh, BMP gives you a long shutdown. I'm, don't worry, I ain't gonna do it again. I'm gonna use all of it next time. I mean, they might have to, I don't know. I, I, even if I make a half pass, I'm probably still gonna go to the end of the track. Yeah, here on out. So we've decided we don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I love it. I'm glad you're okay. And I'm looking at this this old school GS over here, Brad. We've come a long way from this, haven't we? Did you yeah. ever think? Did you ever think in a million years? Did Suzuki ever think in 1980 that somebody in the year 2020 would have a motorcycle out there that looks like this? Crazy, isn't it? It's just mind-boggling. Yeah. And it, this is what this thing started out as over here. I mean, this gas tank here, Mike made this one, took a steel gas tank, cut it up, 
shrank it, kept the stock sizes. Now it's it's at least two inches so shorter. shorter. You know, that's the kind of stuff where people don't realize the amount of hours that were just in a gas tank. And then we took that gas tank and made a mold for the carbon fiber. And yeah. the tail was all one piece of aluminum. You made that and we ran that for about a year or two years and then yeah. Tracy made that out of carbon. So, I mean, that's, that's the type of evolutionary stuff I'm talking about. Do you, yeah, don't start off as one of these. That's amazing. That is so unbelievably staggering. And people love these old bikes, man. I'm an old GS guy, KZ guy, I love it. Do you find yourself running out of t-shirts? Do you sell out of t-shirts? We, we sold, I don't know, 60, 70 t-shirts at Man Cup. It was, I was <laughs> amazed at how many we went through down there, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's it never, I'm always amazed at uh, the popularity of the bike, the, the people that uh, send me a, a message about, hey, can you send us some hero card, buy t-shirts, whatever. I want him to sign them. Those kind of things, it's just, it's amazing. Any desire by you to ever throw a leg over this thing? No, I get asked that a ton. And that whole conversation just had about Richard, you know, being respectful. I got no business riding this thing. You know, there's... You get the same thrill out of turning the wrenches and being the driving force? I am more than happy to stand back and watch him make a great pass as me putting the leg on. This is not something you ride, get on and just get out on the drag strip on. It's not like that. It's, it's, uh... And it's way too fast for me to attempt to ride anymore. Well, guys, I really appreciate this. Uh, everybody loves this motorcycle. Thank you so much for inviting us into your garage. Really appreciate it. Is there anything else we'd like to add? Did I miss anything here? Mm, I don't think no. so. Worldwide, Worldwide bearings. bearings. There you go. My man, Dave Conforti. Yep. And let me tell you what. This brings a tear to Dave's eye because Dave stopped me at PRI and he said one day I'm going to have to come up to his headquarters because he's got all kind of motorcycles like this. He's got KZs, H2s, and, of course, GSs. He's got a uh, warehouse full of neat stuff. I love him, guys. And Dave, has been, Dave has been, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you might look at a bearing as a small part of this motorcycle, but it's just the, the support that he gives, not just us, but the whole drag racing community, everybody. I mean, I don't know a person that he doesn't really just support, help out. And he's a, you know, he's a man of fee. He doesn't say much. He doesn't post a lot on Facebook. But his presence and what we do is huge. He's literally been helping me since I started drag racing at 15 years old. Um, so, you know, just I wanted to give a special plug just to let him know we appreciate you. That's all. You're the man, Dave. So role changes aside, moving forward, is the goal to try to take out McKinney's mark there at a 636? Are we trying to? I think we missed that. Yeah, we missed a shot at that. I think we missed that one. Uh, now, you could always set it up pro open-wise and go after the world's quickest and fastest, right? Yeah, but, you know, the the, the schedule with Pro Street and with, with Brad dwindling down his career, I don't know how much, how many extra passes we want to make beyond what we already got to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, we might have missed that one. And plus, that's not an easy feat. It's not like I'm that close. All right, I'm going to go 636. Once you get to that point of the 640, to go that 400 faster is probably, I don't know what it'll take to do that. So yeah, I think we might've missed that window. I got to sneak one more in here, speaking of pro mod. So you guys run to the quarter, you do it on a street tire with no wheelie bar. When I show pro mod videos on the Cycle Drag YouTube channel, one of the biggest questions is why aren't these guys running to the quarter? And skilled veterans like Paul Gash and everybody, they tell me I got no desire to go that fast in the quarter anymore. But you're doing it without a wheelie bar and on a street tire. Do you think these pro mod guys are missing it by not running to the quarter? No, I think that it's been one of the things that's helped pro mod become healthy again. Um, because if you remember, there was a time back in the quarter mod days at the end of uh, AMA drag bike where it was pretty light out there. You know, it wasn't a lot of bikes racing. Um, um, I think that that's kind of been one of the revivals. Um, I mean, you could blow them up in eighth too, but I think that shortening up the track for those guys has just been a... a of uh, uh, been able to keep them out there and keep them racing. Um, the quarter mile deal, would I like to ride one in a quarter mile? Absolutely. I mean, one of my biggest, if you want us to know what bucket list I have, I would never ride a top fuel motorcycle, mostly because I don't fit them. They're, they're way too big. But with the new turbos, the turbo deal that they're doing now, um, that Dan Wagner and, and Steve Nichols and the DME guys are doing, 
I'd love to ride one of those and go into fives. Let's see you do it, man. I'd love to see it. You got to figure Spider-Man went into fives in 99, and now we got all these other combinations getting so close between the supercharged Harley, between the Pro Mod, between Terry Schweigert and that Turbo GS. Yeah. You got some of them. The 619's a long way from a five. That's right. 619 is fast. 619 is so, fast. And what impressed me about that is I was like, what, the sixth pass on the bike or yeah, something? Yeah, so, yeah. GS power, right? Yep. GS, yeah, long live no, the turbo GS. Power. Turbo, turbo, turbo power. power. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And to clarify earlier, you said I know you guys hate the turbos. We don't hate the turbos. I love them. I love racing against them. Um, it's just. It's, it's a great rivalry. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, it's a, a great, lot of it's fun. It's a great rivalry. And that sticker there was for fun, just to make it fun and, and make it interesting. People in the stands like diversity and. That's really what that is. Um, yeah. I'm not a turbo guy myself, but I um, respect those guys for doing what they do, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a whole different science. Uh, but you gotta have something. I mean, if, if it's all turbo boosts or all turbos and nothing else, and you know, I think that's what we do bring to the table is a little diversity in the class and just something different going down the racetrack. Nobody can ever say this is a cookie cutter motorcycle, that's for sure. No. Cycle Drag Universe, I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank everybody. Mike, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank Richard, you. thank you so much. And thank you. Bad Brad, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. thank you guys so much. We, we told you we would show you a motorcycle unlike anything you've ever seen before. Guys, this thing is, is just amazing. Anything you'd like to add here before we go? I like that Bad Brad name. <laughs> bad Brad. <laughs> that may stick. That may uh, stick. Well, thank you so much. From York, Pennsylvania, make sure you like CycleDrag.com on Facebook. Subscribe to Cycle Drag on YouTube. Smash the bell for notifications. You guys are all subscribed on YouTube, right? Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Much more coming. If there's a fast motorcycle or an impressive motorcycle, let us know where it is. We're coming to cover it. But GS, guys, I don't know if you're going to find any bigger or badder than this one. Thanks for watching.
I hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to subscribe to Cycle Drag on YouTube, like CycleDrag.com on Facebook, and we'll keep it coming. We are here to promote fast motorcycles all over the world. If you have any friends who you think may enjoy this, please refer them. They are always welcome. Thank you for the comments, the feedback. We appreciate it, guys. Thank you for subscribing to Cycle Drag on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave us your feedback and comments on what you think about this incredible Suzuki GS and how fast they can go moving forward. And don't forget to subscribe to Cycle Drag on YouTube, like CycleDrag.com on Facebook, and we'll keep it coming wherever fast motorcycles live. We'll be there. We got your back. Enjoy.